Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibin, and this big hulking beast on my desk is the MyCloud EX4. The folks from Western Digital were kind enough to lend it to me because uh, we've done a lot on the MyCloud, which is their consumer-facing device. Uh, this one is a very similar device, except it brings a lot more features and a lot more power to the, uh, to the task. So we're going to take a look at this hardware, specifically about how it differs from the WD MyCloud. So all the sharing and a lot of the other features that uh, the MyCloud does, this one has as well. So we're not going to go too much into those, but we are going to look at all the differentiators. So the first thing you're going to notice is that it is a lot bigger than the MyCloud. This is a almost feels as heavy as like a as a computer. In fact, many computers are in this form factor. So this is a, a pretty beefy case. Now you'll notice on the front here uh, there are four drive slots, and that is because there are four hard drives. Now this one came configured with four drives already installed. So there's eight terabytes total, uh, two terabytes per drive, and they included these. Uh, uh, and you can get it like configured like this. So this is about a $750 unit at the moment, at the time I'm shooting this. Uh, and these come with uh, the red drives, which are designed for RAID arrays. They're 5,400 RPM, uh, two terabyte drives, and there is four of them in here for a total of eight terabytes. And I'll show you what that means as far as real storage in a few minutes when we boot it up. So uh, the drives go in like this. You can, they say, uh, hot swap the drives, but I would be careful when you have a running RAID array not to get too, you know, too clumsy with it. Uh, the way it's configured by default is RAID 5, so you can have one drive out uh, and still have an operating array, but you really, I would, I would shut it down before taking drives out just to be safe. And again, we're going to go into detail about how all this stuff gets configured. Uh, your power switch is here. Uh, there is a, a bank of LED displays to tell you which drive is doing what. There's also a, a, little display on, a little display on the device as well. Thankfully, it wasn't on when I just <laughs> shuttered it across the desk there. Um, on the back, you have, now this is where it gets interesting. You have two Ethernet ports on board, so you can kind of split the load. These are both gigabit Ethernet ports. The drive supports iSCSI, which is a uh, kind of a different protocol than your standard networking protocols. It's a uh, kind of a storage attached network uh, uh, protocol for inexpensive storage devices. I'm going to show you uh, the screen where you configure that, not the iSCSI usage yet today because I'm still trying to get it to work on my Mac, but we'll do another video about that. There are two USB 3.0 ports on the back, so you can uh, you know, hook up external drives like you can do on the MyCloud. It also has redundant power supply, or at least redundant power ports. It comes with only one power supply, but you can uh, plug in two different uh, power supplies so that you have some redundancy in case something goes awry. So I'm going to plug it in here. Uh, we're going to put it into uh, port one here, and we'll get the, uh, the beast fired up here. Um, and you can hear the fan going. It's got a pretty big fan. It doesn't make a lot of noise when it's not under load. So I found that uh, generally it doesn't make uh, too much of a fan noise. You could probably keep it in an office, but um, if you have a basement data center like I do, or, or a table where there's a bunch of data components on it, uh, that might be the way to go. Uh, so right now it's booting up. You can see the display here. What happens after it does get loaded uh, is you can scroll through and see what uh, IP address has been assigned to the device. It'll also give you, you know, kind of push button access to see the health of the RAID array as well. So if you're, you're not at your computer, you can kind of take a look and see how all that is working. So we're going to take a quick break and I'm going to boot up my computer, get this thing booted up and show you all that it does. So we'll be right back. All right, we got the drive booted up. I just wanted to show you the display before we move too much further, just to so show you what's on it. Uh, it tells you the name of the device, and you can change that anytime you want. Uh, the IP address that's currently assigned to it, uh, the temperature of the unit, and the current firmware that's on there. And it can update the firmware automatically, uh, or you can uh, go in and do that when you know on, on a manual basis as well. So if you're a little nervous about firmware breaking uh, the device, you can choose when to do that. Uh, it tells you the fan speed. I have found it's very quiet. It's not very loud on the desk, and uh, even the drives aren't too noisy, so it could be something that, like I said before, can coexist in the office with you. Uh, drive status is healthy right now, so all the drives are in good shape, which I would expect because they're all new. And it also tells you the capacity that's available for the array in total. And uh, you'll notice that we have um, four two terabyte drives for a total of eight but only six terabytes is available. And I'll show you why that is in a second, because it's based on uh, the default RAID configuration that's currently on the drive. So let's pop over to uh, the configuration screen. Now, what I want to point out right off the bat is that we're not going to cover shares, users, or cloud access, because these are all identical to how the WD MyCloud works. And I've done a really extensive set of reviews on that. Uh, so you can check out those reviews to see uh, where those things are. Um, but beyond that, on this part of the control panel, the only addition here is just a little guide to uh, what the uh, device is doing from a CPU and network standpoint. So uh, this benchmark I'm running is really whacking the CPU pretty hard, uh, but we still have a good amount of RAM available. There's 512 megs of RAM in total, 
and uh, you can uh, do some neat stuff with it, which I will show you in a few minutes. But before we do, let us go into the main guts of the device here, which is the storage configuration. And uh, right now uh, we have it in its default configuration, which is a RAID 5 array. And let me go here to the change RAID mode so I can kind of explain what the different options are and uh, what these can do for you. So RAID can be a very complicated thing. And one of the things that I like about uh, what WD is doing with these network attached storage devices is simplifying uh, the configuration of this because you can do this uh, on your own with uh, your own hardware and it's not impossible, but for a lot of people starting out, it's probably not uh, the best uh, experience because it can be uh, fraught with disaster if you don't know what you're doing. So uh, they really simplified everything for you. And you have um, a number of different RAID options. So the default is RAID 5. And what this does is it uh, basically spans data across all four disks. It does something called striping. And uh, what it'll do is it, when it writes data, it writes just across all four, and then it dedicates a quarter of each drive for fault tolerance. So if you were to lose a drive, uh, you can pull out that bad drive and put in a new fresh drive, and it will rebuild the array without losing any data at all. If you lose more than one drive, you're in trouble, but uh, chances are, if you're keeping an eye on things, uh, you'll, you'll know that the bad drive and where it is, you can pull that drive out, put in another one, and you'll be back on your way with no data loss, which is really, really helpful. So um, that is where they kind of put it at the default. RAID 5 is kind of like the best uh, you know, compromise for speed and, uh, and redundancy. Uh, but you have some scarier options too. Now they have something here called JBOD, which is called just a bunch of disks. Now technically, uh, JBOD, the way they have it here, which is uh, four drives configured as four separate volumes and spanning, are, are both JBOD kind of configurations. But uh, in short, you can basically set up four, four drives to act, act independently, each as their own uh, shared drive. So you can kind of think of that as you know, the WD MyCloud product. You can think of four of those inside one of these. You can basically access each drive individually, two terabytes apiece, and uh, no redundancy of those drives, but you have access to uh, the full amount of data. You could span them also, which basically uh, you know, fill, makes one big large volume. So you'd have uh, eight terabytes available to you and it would just fill the drives up as it goes. Um, very similar configuration would be RAID 0 where it will stripe across multiple hard drives um, for faster performance, faster reading uh, and writing. However, um, these two options, spanning and RAID 0, uh, are called scary RAID because if you lose one drive, you lose all the data. Everything is dependent upon uh, everything working and if you lose a drive in those modes, you're totally out of luck. So. RAID 0 and spanning are you know, really not uh, the best thing to do if you really care about your data because you want to have some redundancy. And you know, when you have a, a, a complex system with four drives, one failure is likely at some point uh, to take down everything. So um, just be aware of that. Uh, RAID 1 is just basically a mirrored configuration. So what you could do, um, and you can configure this a couple different ways, you could take uh, you know, two drives and, and mirror uh, partition onto both of them. You could um, take two drives together and then mirror those two. You can basically span them and then mirror them onto the other set. Uh, so it's a way to do a little bit of spanning. You could do like maybe two, four uh, one four terabyte configuration and have it mirrored uh, to the other set of drives as well. So you have a little bit of redundancy there. Uh, RAID 5 is what we just talked about. And then RAID 10 is a, um, a way to mirror and stripe at the same time. So it's a little bit more robust in that uh, you're striping to drives and also mirroring them at the same time. So uh, that's another option available to you as well. RAID 10 works better when you have more disks, in my opinion, but you can, uh, you can do that. So a lot of options. It's really hard, though, to change from one of these RAID configurations to another. So you're going to want to choose carefully. I really think you know, their default of RAID 5 is probably the safest bet. Uh, to go with, but if you want to get riskier, you can certainly do that. We might do some benchmarks in future videos where we see how the performance varies uh, depending on which one you choose. So uh, that is the RAID configuration. Uh, one thing I like about this is they have this neat disk status area here where you can really dig in deep to see uh, the health of the drive. So you can click on here and get an idea of what drive you have built into uh, or plugged into the, your uh, device at the moment. And you can kind of dig into its smart data here so you can really see uh, all the little errors and things that are coming off the drive. And uh, you might be able to notice if you see something out of whack, if you know what you're looking at here, and know that maybe your drive is starting to fail a little bit. Sometimes the, the drive may not report it's having problems, um, you know, even though it might be running up some bad errors and stuff. So you could see an error, pop that drive out, put in another one, and uh, really prevent a bad thing from happening. Uh, another thing we're not going to cover in detail in this video because I haven't figured out how to use it yet um, is iSCSI. And what this is is a, a way to create inexpensive storage attached networks. And iSCSI is a protocol that uh, basically allows you to uh, connect to a drive over the 
the Ethernet networks. So you can basically plug in, I would actually use the second port for this. Um, and it's a higher performing kind of storage protocol that allows you to mount a drive as a local drive on your computer. So basically the computer thinks it's just connected uh, up with it, you know, with its normal, uh, you know, ATA connection or something like that. It makes it really think that it's just not over a network that's actually directly connected. Really neat that this supports this and neat that it supports it concurrently with uh, the standard protocols. When you set up the iSCSI, it becomes like a separate little volume. So uh, you can't really access that uh, as a share. I think well, there's a way to connect to it and then reshare it through the device for the other computers on the network. But um, it's a little complicated. We're going to uh, do dig into that in a little bit. And I'd love uh, if you have some experience with this, especially how to get it to work on a Mac. I would love to hear uh, some, uh, some comments on that because I haven't really played with this yet. Uh, you can also volume virtualize. So you can connect to iSCSI targets and then present them as volumes. So basically what you can do is connect to an iSCSI device. I would imagine you could probably connect to uh, one of these internally, kind of loop it, uh, so that it can be made available to computers that are not using the iSCSI protocol. So you can uh, you know, have the best of both worlds there. So really neat that it supports this, because this is like a high-end uh, storage attached network, SAS thing that, that uh, they use in the enterprise that you can have uh, in your home with something uh, like this. So uh, pretty cool there. Another thing to check out is the backups. So, uh, as we know on the WD MyCloud, they had something called the safe point where it would take the whole contents of the drive and just dump it out over USB. Now, you know this one has two USB ports on board, so you have a few more options available uh, just in the sense that you can attach more devices directly to it. Uh, but you can, just like you could on the other uh, WD MyCloud, back up uh, to an external USB drive. Uh, the difference is, is that you can choose which folders to back up. So, you know, where the MyCloud was kind of an all or nothing thing, the EX4 is pick the folder that you want to back up and send it over there. So if you had like a scratch folder that you don't care about the data in, you didn't want to back it up, you can just exclude that from the backup, just choose the folders you want and fire them over to the USB. It doesn't in this, in this USB backup mode, doesn't support scheduled backups, which I hope they add, because I think that would make uh, this a lot more useful. So you can't schedule a USB backup uh, but you can pop into the control panel, hit the button, and only back up the things that you want. You can also build a bunch of backup jobs, so you can uh, specify different backups to go to different drives and that sort of thing, so uh, pretty useful there. Um, you have remote backups, and if you had another EX4, and I think you might be able to schedule this one, um, you can connect to another EX4 device, whether it's on your local network or across the, the wherever, across the world on the space station, whatever. Uh, you can point these at each other and then send the backup from one EX4 unit to another, uh, which is a pretty cool feature. Uh, you can do an internal backup. So, you know, I know sometimes in my office people tend to delete things by accident. So you can do an internal backup just onto the drive itself. So you have a copy of the files that uh, people might be accessing. And that's, uh, that can be useful, again, if you have people in the office that uh, sometimes screw things up. Um, and you also can set a schedule for that. So you can do that on the internal side. Of course, it doesn't get the um, backup off of the uh, device, but you could maybe initiate a USB backup and then have backups of backups. So <laughs> it's a little meta thing there for you. Um, you also have cloud backups, and this is really cool. So um, if you've ever used Amazon S3, I use it all the time. It's a uh, cloud-based storage from Amazon. It's very inexpensive, relatively speaking, and they charge you only for what you put in. So they charge you by the gigabyte and by the transfer that you're doing back and forth. And what you can do is configure this to, and I have one backup here going already. I can just uh, fire it off right now if I wanted to. Um, what it'll do is basically take whatever, actually I'm going to stop that because the, the, the thing I'm doing right now is a huge, uh, <laughs> huge file. Um, what it can do is grab whatever is in that folder that you specified and it will shoot it off into Amazon's cloud on a scheduled basis. And again, you can choose which folders to pick. So it's, there's a lot of granularity to it. You could back up some folders to different S3 buckets and all that sort of thing. And it's a great way to, you know, peace of mind, totally get this offsite onto Amazon's cloud. Um, no fuss, no muss. You set it up once and it'll just automatically fire off um, whenever you want it to, uh, to back up those files. It also does those backups incrementally if you so choose. So if you, you know, if you had like 40 gigs that you wanted to back up initially and then you maybe added a couple megabytes a day, it would only add the new files in during that backup queue. So really cool that that works. It also works with Elephant Drive. I've never used Elephant Drive, but um, it does support that as well. And I would imagine over time they'll probably uh, support more things like that. But that's not all. There's some other stuff in here that I found pretty cool. So, you know, as I said before, this is a, you know, pretty much a server. It's running Linux. It's got 512 megs of RAM on board. Uh, and what they've done is allowed you to kind of get into it a little bit. You can do the SSH thing like we showed you on the MyCloud product. Uh, you can do with this. You can get root access. But uh, if you don't want to get 
or risk screwing it up and want to install some applications, they give you the option to do that. So uh, you click the little add button here and you can see there's a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, PHP My Admin, there's a PHP Bulletin Board, uh, Joomla, which is a, uh, you know, a content management system, WordPress, Git. Um, you can even grab uh, files off of Usenet from using NZB files. Uh, Transmission, which is a, um, I believe it's a BitTorrent client, is also on here as well. So you can install these applications and use that. Again, you're not going to run a web server off of this thing for the public, but a uh, great way is like a corporate intranet, especially using WordPress or Joomla. You can kind of you know, keep it all up to date in there. And it, of course, it's redundantly uh, stored on the array and of course backed up whenever you run the backup. So kind of a useful way to add a, you know instant in intranet to your office without having to dedicate uh, computer hardware to the task. Um, in addition to that, it does have a built-in torrent uh, device on here as well. I'm just going to turn it off in a second, but um, you can add a file, um, a torrent file here, and have it um, go ahead and download that stuff. You can also uh, have it be a BitTorrent server too. So if, uh, if you're doing that for legal purposes, of course, you can certainly do that. Uh, you also have the ability to browse the files on the device via the web browser here as well. So we can pop into my folder here and see what uh, files are being uh, written to it at, the point, at that point in time. I'm running a disk speed right now, so you can see that that file is there. Um, so all of that is pretty cool. It does support WebDAV, and it supports FTP, so you have an FTP server. I mean, there is just a lot of stuff you can do on this. Uh, one last thing to show you is just the, uh, the basic settings thing before we get to uh, the, uh, the, the um, benchmarks. Um, a few things that I noticed on here that were different than the MyCloud is just, the again, the level of granularity you can get uh, with all of the... Uh, all of the network settings here, you can set the frame size, you have, I don't even know what this is, so you can tell me what this stuff is. Um, there's a SMB settings, you can turn the FTP access on, NFS service, WebDAV, LLTD, SNMP, I mean, you, you have an acronym, you could probably uh, get that to work on here. So uh, really cool, you can even set up uh, your dynamic DNS on here as well, so if you're, you know, wanted to maybe make part of it uh, public facing, you can do that with a domain name. Um, you know, again, you can just go on and on and on. It also uh, supports Active Directory too, so you can uh, get it authenticated through your Active Directory server. ISO mount is pretty cool too. So if you had like an, uh, an ISO image of a CD, you can uh, just contain that ISO file and mount it and make it shareable uh, to the rest of your network. You can also uh, create ISOs if you wanted to. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Then like the other device, it's got the DLNA server and the iTunes server on board, and you can check out my videos of the MyCloud to see how all of that works. And then there's some uh, basic system diagnostics and some other stuff. So performance-wise, let's talk about performance for a minute. Um, and from a lot of the reviews that I read prior to my own testing of the device, you know, they were saying that it was high, had a lot of functionality, but not so great on the performance side. I would agree with that uh, to a large extent. You know, the read speeds are pretty good here. I like to, I like to run this uh, disk test from uh, Blackmagic. I'll see it spike to like 55, 60 megabytes of write per second, and then it kind of drops back down into this 30 megabyte range. Um, the reads definitely hover, you know, in the, you know, this 60 to 75 megabyte territory. So it kind of fluctuates a little bit. It's not going to be a speed demon on your network. And I think it's you know, partly due maybe to the CPU and some of the components inside. Um, and I was reading somewhere too where they put faster drives in and didn't see a huge performance increase either. But you know, it, this is one of those things where you know, I would not say this is a, a high performance networking tool, but it's certainly a very useful network tool. So um, depending on what your uses are, if you have a need for high write speeds, this is probably not uh, it's going to do it for you, but uh, if you have a need for a lot of functionality, a lot of simple RAID configuration, then this is going to be a really good way to add that functionality to your small office, to your home network, or whatever. And um, I, I think I can find a lot of uses for this because right now I've got a Drobo that's about probably about eight, six years old now, I think, and uh, it's starting to get a little long in the tooth. This is certainly faster than that and a lot quieter. Um, so that's uh, you know something that I might use it for. So. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, you need to take e all these things in when you're you know, trying to evaluate what product might work best for you. Um, but I think uh, performance-wise, it's certainly uh, a little behind, but all the functionality for me is certainly enough to win me over on it. So that is part one of this review. What I want to do is uh, play around a little bit with that iSCSI that I was talking about. So when that video is up, I'll link to it here. But I want your questions too, because one of the great things that came out of the MyCloud was that I learned a lot more about the product from the questions that you asked. So ask some questions and uh, we'll answer some in the comments if they're easy ones. And then for the more complex ones that might require a little bit of demonstration, I will go back into this product and uh, dive a little deeper and get those questions answered for you. So this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching.